The title for this presentation is Nicaea to QOD. And I want us to look back at the history of what brought about the Council of Nicaea and how it has affected the church in the centuries that have transpired since then. So without further ado, I want you to open your Bibles with me to our opening text. It's found in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter. Revelation chapter 13, in the first 11 verses, a power is revealed. And we're going to look at what it says regarding this power in verse 4. Let's read it together. Well, actually, we're going to begin with the last part of verse 3. It says, And all the world wondered after the beast. Speaking of this power that is seen arising out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns that is likened to a leopard, has the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. It says that all the world wonders after this beast. And then in verse 4, it says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? These verses bring to view the history surrounding Nicaea. This is God's, in a sense, painting the picture of what would transpire at the time of Nicaea. These words tell us what would be the result of it, that all the world would wonder after the beast, and all the world would come to worship this beast. And not only beast, but the dragon that gave power to the beast. Now, worship is here mentioned. The whole intent of the beast is to receive worship in the place of God. So this is the key of this verse, to understanding the nature of this verse. Now, worship of God is done primarily in two ways, or I should say one primarily way. We know that in John chapter 4 it tells us that God is worshipped how? In spirit and in truth. The spirit is a representation of the word, and the truth is a representation of the word. God is worshipped primarily in this world through his word. As we read the word of God, as we believe it, and as we obey it, we give God reverence. We worship him. God is, is worshipped through his truth. It is the means of our sanctification. And so to worship God is to read and obey his word, to follow the things that are written therein. But it tells us that this power would seek to draw worship to itself. And so the same that applies to the worship of God would apply to the worship of this beast. If we're to worship God, we obey him by believing and following his word. But if we are to worship a beast or a man-made power or system, how would we do this? Well, we would do it by obeying men rather than the word of God by believing what they say about the word of God instead of believing the word of God itself. This is one of the ways in which Satan receives worship, the dragon. And it's through the apostate religious systems of this world that he receives worship by leading men f away from the word of God, away from the worship of God, to the worship of those that set themselves up in the place of God. And that is what's pictured here in this first beast. But notice verses 11 and 12. A second beast is seen arising. And it tells us, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So what we read in this verse is that history will be repeated. All the world would worship the first beast. And that beast would eventually receive a deadly wound. Its power would come to an end. But it tells us that at the time this beast comes to an end, another beast would see, see rising out of the earth. This beast would then lead all the world back to the worship of the first beast. 
Do you see it? Yes. You have a repeat of history. History will be repeated. And it will, it will be done by the power that is here represented by this second beast. It will be the agent that leads all the world to the worship of the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now, how does it do it? God gives us a clue. He helps us to understand the nature the, or the way in which this will be done. Let's look at verse 16. It tells us after the creation of an image to this first beast, in verse 16, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their, in their hand, right hand, excuse me, or in their foreheads. So how is this carried out? By causing men, all men, great or small, rich or free, to receive a mark, either in their hand or in their head. Now, what does that signify? The hand represents our actions. Now, worship can be compulsory. It can be compelled. Therefore, the beast can put its mark in the hand. It can compel you to worship. But worship is not only received compulsory by the beast. It also works through the head. It can work by means of deception, by leading men away from the word of God and deceiving them, indoctrinating them in error. It also receives worship thereby. So it tells us that the beast puts its mark in the head or in the hand. It will either deceive you by means of its doctrines or will compel you by means of its force to worship. And so history will be repeated by these means. And it was by these very same means that the, bird, the beast, the first beast, was worshipped in the early centuries and through the centuries. And we're going to see how this played out. Let me read a quote to you. This was written in 1861. It helps us understand, as I call it, the pathway of apostasy, the steps that are taken in apostasy. And he lists them out here. The author is John Loughborough. In 1861, in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, he wrote these words. He said, the first step of apostasy is to get up a creed telling us what we shall believe. This is what a creed does. It tells us what we shall believe or what we must believe. The second is to make that creed a test of fellowship. Number three, or the third, is to try members by that creed. The fourth, to denounce as heretics those who do not believe that creed. And the fifth and final, to commence persecution against such. Now these, according to Loughborough, and I agree with him, are the steps of apostasy. They are the steps that every church has taken in the road to apostasy. It's been tried and true through history. When you look at history, you look at the records of history and the nations and churches that have united, this is the course that they have taken from step one to step five. But in order to carry out these steps, something has to happen first. Before a church can carry out this apostasy, especially step number five, you read it there, it says, and commence persecution against such. Now, in order to persecute someone, you have to have power to persecute them. And a church as such has none. A church has no power to persecute. We have no armies. We have no soldiers. We have no means of carrying out real persecution against anyone. And so in order to effectively carry out and enforce the creed and the decisions that have been made against those heretics, state must be involved, or civil power. And so before these steps can really be enforced, there needs to be a union, a union of church and state. And in history, we see that this is exactly what happened. And it happened just prior to the Council of Nicaea. 
specifically the years 312 A.D. to 323. In the year 312, or very close to 312 in the beginning of 313, ended the ten years of church of the greatest ten years of persecution against the Christian church. And at that time, as Emperor Constantine was embroiled in a, in a civil war in the Roman Empire to eliminate the other competitors for the title of Augustus or Caesar, he supposedly saw a vision that he was to conquer under the sign of the cross. And it was under this sign that he was to gain victory. And so according to history and according to Constantine and Eusebius, who wrote the history surrounding this time, it tells us that Constantine united with the church. And there was a church-state union. The church helped Constantine gain victory over his enemies until Constantine in the year 323, in his victory over Licinius, became the sole Roman emperor over the Roman Empire. And so, because the church had helped Constantine, now it was time for Constantine to help the church, as it is with marriages, you see. And so, now it was time for the church or to receive its benefit. And that would be that the state would enforce its dogmas. But you see, the church at this time had no dogma but the word of God. And the intent of the church was not to lead men to the worship of God, but to lead them to the worship of men. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Acts chapter 20, when he was speaking to the elders of Miletus, he called them together and he said that he warned them that after his departing, that grievous wolves would enter in among the flock and they would not spare the flock. And he said, even from men among you, and he was speaking to the bishops and elders of the church. He said, some from among you will rise up and speak perverse things to draw away disciples after yourselves. Paul, speaking of the days that would follow the departure of the apostles, he saw what was coming and he warned them of it. For the space of three years, he says, he warned them of these things. And we see that not long after the demise of the apostles, this work began. But before the church's dogmas could be enforced, they had to have dogmas. And the church as yet had nothing but the word of God. And we see right at this time, that it was at such a time, that a creed began to be formulated. In the year 323, an event happened that would change the course of history, not only of the church, but of the world. It seemed very small at the time. An argument arose among two men in the church of Alexandria. Their names were Alexander and Arius. Keep those names in your mind. We'll come back to them. But I want to go back for about the space of a century and lay the groundwork, the historical events that brought us to this climactic point in the history of the church. And it goes back about 100 years an historian documents these series of events in these words. He tells us that simplicity was the greatest appendage to Christianity to maintain unity. What was the greatest appendage? Simplicity, he says. The teachers inculcated no doctrines further than those contained in the Apostles' Creed and avoided all vain subtleties and mysterious researches. There was not at this time the least controversy about the capital doctrines, which were afterwards so keenly debated in the church. Now, he's speaking of the second century here, between 100 to 200 A.D. He continues, This was soon swamped by the laborious efforts of human learning and dark subtleties of imaginary science. Acute researchers were employed upon several religious points, not vital regarding salvation. And human philosophy was incorporated into the simplicity of our divine master's sublimer system. He says, a new sect of philosophers suddenly arose 
and spread with amazing rapidity through a great part of the Roman Empire. Now notice what he says. Alexandria in Egypt gave birth to this new philosophy. They were ready to adopt the truth alone from all different systems and sects. Their discipline was approved of by the Christians and all those who had charge of the Christian school at Alexandria. This philosophy underwent a change when Ammonius Zaccus laid the foundation of that sect known as the New Platonic or Neoplatonism. His projects were singular, for he even strove to have a coalition of all sects, both philosophical and religious, and taught a doctrine which he considered as adapted to unite all in perfect harmony. He ends by saying, This absurd philosophy, embraced by Origen and other Christians, was very detrimental to the beautiful simplicity of the celestial doctrines of Christ. So what he tells us, in short, without going into great detail of history, is that around the second century, philosophers began to spread, Greek philosophy especially, throughout the Roman Empire. And it found its home in Alexandria. It was there that a catechetical school, which is a school for the instruction of those who came to be taught in the, the teachings of the church. And this school became the home of this Neoplatonic teaching. And those who taught at this school, Origen being among them, as well as other Christians, began to adopt this idea of Platonic thinking, that truth was found in all religions and in all teachings of the world, and they sought to blend it with that of Christianity. And so you have the pure teaching of the Word of God cluttered with all this paganism, it was in this school and in the city of Alexandria that we find the crisis arose in the 4th century A.D. And it arose by two men, as I mentioned, Alexander, who was the bishop of Alexandria, and Arius, who was a presbyter or elder underneath Alexander. And they had an argument. We're not going to go into the theological part of this uh, debate but they argued about the nature of Christ. And the argument was, led them to a point where they could not reconcile themselves. And they fought back and forth. And it came to the point where the state got involved in this argument. It embroiled itself from one end of the empire to the other. And I just want to read here a statement that Sister White penned in the Great Controversy helping us understand the nature of how this philosophy worked in the church. She says, The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men, who with a pretense of great wisdom teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning, not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers, she says, it was to such a class that Jesus declared, ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. And that's some great controversy, page 598. Notice that she says that the truths most plainly revealed in the scripture would be clouded in darkness. Men would seek to draw people away from the word of God to themselves. This is precisely what began to transpire in the church, beginning in the second century A.D., and really beginning to culminate, come to a head in the fourth century A.D. And it's what led to the Council of Nicaea. And it was there, in the Council of Nicaea, that the first official Christian creed was adopted. We know it today as the Nicene Creed. Now, A.T. Jones, who was one of our Adventist historians, notes the circumstances in these words. It's in his book, The Great Empires of Prophecy. He says, just at this time, that is at the fourth century, around the first part of the fourth century, there sprang into prominence the famous Trinitarian controversy, which involved and under the circumstances demanded an imperial decision as to what was the Catholic Church in point of doctrine. Now, just a few years prior, there had been a controversy between two sects within the Christian camp. 
and it devolved upon the state to determine which of those two sects would be considered the Catholic Church. That was called the Donatist Controversy. And it led to the establishment of what we know today as the Catholic Church. The state decided that it would only recognize this sect, and they were to be known as the Catholic or Universal Church. But it had as yet no official doctrine or creed. And it wasn't until the year 325 A.D. that an official creed was given. And it was at this time that the Catholic Church had an official Catholic doctrine. And it came about over an argument regarding the Trinity. Now, both these men, Arius and Alexander, were what you would call Trinitarians. Because the Trinity at that time was not yet as fully defined as it is now. It was simply the belief in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And both of these men believed in what, we, what was called then the Trinity. So it was a debate over how the Trinity and their relation would be defined. And it came to be defined under the Nicene Creed. And it was at this point that the church had a creed. And because of the union to the state, now that creed could be enforced. Notice this statement. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of the history surrounding this creed and how it was formulated. But the lesson behind that event of the Nicene Creed is penned in words that I think should be indelved upon the mind of everyone here. A.T. Jones, in his book, The Great Empires of Prophecy, tells us what was the result of that Nicene Council in 325 A.D. in these words. He says, In the quest for truth, every man is free to search, to believe, and to decide for himself alone. And his assent to any form of belief or doctrine to be true must spring from his own personal conviction that such is the truth. In other words, it must spring from conscience, is what he is saying. He continues, The truth itself, forced on man otherwise than by its own inward power, becomes falsehood. And that is a quote from Neander in his History of the Christian Church. He goes on, And he who suffers anything to be forced upon him utters a lie against himself and against God. He continues. He says, The realm of thought, which is one of the places where the mark of the beast is placed in the forehead. He says, The realm of thought is the realm of whom? It is the realm of God. Whosoever would attempt to restrict or coerce the free exercise of the thought of another usurps the dominion of God and exercises that of the devil. And I put before you here today that that is precisely what, is a, cre what a creed is intended to do. He continues, he says, This is what Constantine did at the Council of Nice, or Nicaea. This is what the majority of the Council of Nice itself did. In carrying out the purpose for which it was met, this is the only thing that it could do, no matter which side of the controversy should prove victorious, whether it be Arius's point of view or Alexander's point of view. Both desired that their definition, that their expression of the nature of Christ should be adopted as the official Catholic doctrine. He continues, What Constantine and the Council of Nice did was to open the way and set the wicked precedent for that despotism over thought, which continued for more than 1,400 dreary years, and which was carried to such horrible lengths when the Pope succeeded to the place of Constantine as head over both church and state. To say that the Holy Spirit had any part whatever in the council, either in discussing or deciding the question, or in any other way, is but to argue that the Holy Spirit of God is but the subject and tool of the unholy passions of ambitious 
and wicked men. End quote. Do you understand what he's saying? What the church did in formulating a creed was to formulate a doctrine that then was to be imposed upon everyone in the church. Not only did you have to believe in God, but you had to believe in God as it was defined by the church, as he was defined by the church. And not only did you have to believe it, but you had to believe it as it was written in the very words, as it was expressed in the very words of that creed. This is the nature of a creed. It's created to conform people to the thoughts and meanings of men, not to the thought and intent of the Word of God. Because men need no creed but the Bible. The moment we begin to redefine things in words that are apart or not found in the Bible, we are redefining them in men's coined phrases. And by doing that, you try to conform people's minds to your way of thinking. And that what is a creed is designed to do. And that's what the church did. Now, I shouldn't say just the church, but the church and the state combined. They were wed together to carry this out. And as historians like to say, the rest is history. When you look at the history, of especially of Western Europe and the Western world from 325 to the present, you see the outworking of that creed. And it developed, it grew, its language was refined and further defined to the point as we have it today. And the purpose was to conform men to the worship of God according to the view and thoughts of men. In other words, it was for men to draw away disciples after themselves. This was precisely what it was intended to do. We call that period of time over which the church and state ruled together the Dark Ages. The Papal Age, we might call it, or an age of darkness. During that time, the word of God was removed from the hands of the common men. It was locked away in a foreign language that only the learned knew, and they were few. So that the people had not the knowledge of the word of God, and all they knew about God was locked away in the words of men. And so it was that the world wondered after the beast, and the world worshipped the dragon and the beast which the dragon had given power to. It was in this way that it was carried out, and it began in 325 AD over an argument regarding God, or as they termed it, the Trinity. And that argument, that debate, and the consequences reverberate down to our very day. But even though the world was enveloped in darkness, there were those during that age of darkness who held the lamp of truth alight at the risk of persecution, at the risk of the loss of possessions and even of their own lives. They held up the word of God to the people as the only word of God, as the only lamp to men's feet, as the only creed that we have and these men, many of them, lost their lives for upholding that truth. And it wasn't until the turn of the 14th century, around 1370, that a movement was set in foot by God to give back to the people what I hold in my hands here today. Now, this is the Bible, but it's not just any Bible. It's the King James Bible. And the history behind how this book came to be is one that every Christian should know because it cost many men their lives to give to us, to give back to the people of God that which was to be the lamp to their feet and the light to their path. God could not be worshipped in this way and God determined that he would be worshipped in spirit and in truth and to fulfill that he gave back to his people his word. And so we have it today. And it took nearly 300 years or more of persecution, suffering, and death
for that word to be given back to the people of God. Notice what the prophet Daniel says regarding this time. In Daniel chapter 12, we begin in verse 4. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Here the word of God is written to us, telling us that at the time of the end, that is the time of the end of the first beast, when its reign would come to an end of 1260 years, at that time, it says that the book would be unsealed. Many would run to and fro, and knowledge would be increased. And this is not speaking of just any knowledge, but specifically of the knowledge of the Word of God. The knowledge of the Bible would begin to increase. And this is what the prophet is speaking of here. And it would begin when the first beast went into, or I should say, received its deadly wound, and its power came to an end. But notice verses 9 through 10. The angel says to Daniel, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Again, speaking to this same time period. And verse 10, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall what? Do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall what? What is it that the wise shall understand? The wise shall understand the words written in this book. Many would run to and fro. Knowledge would increase in the word of God. And the wise would understand the things that were written therein. God would bring back his people to a state just as it was prior to the days of Nicaea. When the word of God was held in its simplicity when it was believed as it was written in the word of God, God would bring his church back to that period. This is what is here prophesied. God would give them back the Bible, and men would begin to study it to understand the things written therein. Light would be increased. The wise, we are told, would understand. And thus we are brought to the time when history would begin to repeat itself. The first beast had come to its end. That portion of the history of the world had come to an end. The world had worshipped the beast. But that time of the worship of the beast had come to an end. It received its deadly wound, and men were led back to the worship of God. But as we read in the book of Revelation chapter 13, that history would be repeated. And we're going to see how that history was repeated. It brings us to shortly after 1798, which was, according to prophecy, the time of the end. At that time, a nation came into power. That nation is the United States. And in the United States was led the movement which spread worldwide. We call it the Advent Advent movement. There were ministers, specifically here in the United States, who from the study of the scriptures and specifically of the prophecies were led to believe of the near approach or near advent or coming of Christ. And they began to preach it around 1831, beginning around 1831. This we know of as the Advent movement. It was at that time that God began to gather his people together again. Those who would stand upon thus saith the Lord. Those who wanted no creed but the Bible, God began to gather together again to establish his people upon a firm platform of truth. For the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14 that the first angel says to fear God and give glory to him and to worship him that made heaven and the earth and the fountains of waters, that the earth was going to be brought back, those upon the earth, to the worship of the true God to the worship of him who had created heaven and earth. And it was the work of the Advent movement to fulfill that prophecy. And it transpired between the years 1831 to 1863. At that time, the Advent people preached the message. And we know that there was in 1844 prophesied the coming of Christ. But that coming 
to the earth as they supposed did not happen, and there was a great disappointment. But those who survived that great disappointment were brought together, and through the study of the word of God, they understood from the book of Revelation in the closing words of chapter 10 that they were to prophesy again. Though they had been disappointed and their hopes had been dashed of the coming of Christ, yet they believed that the prophecy was true and that the time was true, but that somehow they must have gotten the event wrong. And so they began to study the word of God to understand their disappointment. But more than this, they searched the word of God to understand how they were to carry forward the message to the people. For the Bible prophesied that after that disappointment, they were to prophesy again. And they earnestly sought from the scriptures and studied how they were to do that. They became, they became united under a platform of biblical truth. God established them upon a platform of biblical truth. And the book questions on doctrine, speaking of those who were involved in this study at this time, in the mid-1840s to the early part of the 1860s, and page 29 and 30, it says this. It says, Nor did they, speaking of the Advent people, at first seek to define the nature of the Godhead or the problems of Christology involving the deity of Christ and his nature during the incarnation, the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit. So what the author is telling us here is that at that time, they were not trying to define the things that were written in the Bible. They were simply trying to understand what was written and to establish themselves upon a thus saith the Lord. They were not trying to establish a creed, as they tell us, for in 1872, just a matter of nine years after the Seventh-day Adventist Church was officially formed, after those studies had concluded in 1863 and a solid platform of 24 essential beliefs were established, this was written in the, what you would call the introduction or preamble to that statement or fundamental principles. They tell us that in presenting to the public this synopsis of our faith, we wish to have it distinctly understood that we have no articles of faith, creed, or discipline aside from the Bible. We do not put forth this, that is the fundamental principles, which were 24 at that time. We do not put forth this as having any authority with our people, nor is it designed to secure uniformity among them as a system of faith but is a brief statement of what is and has been with great unanimity held by them, end quote. This was what our fundamental principles were intended to do. They were simply a statement of what those who had studied the word of God and who were led of the spirit of God concluded from. And as we know from the words of inspiration, it was through the moving of the spirit, through the spirit of prophecy, that these fundamental principles were established. And they were not intended to be a creed. Men did not have to believe it as it was stated there. Men were free to believe it and search it and express it in their own words. These were not intended to be a creed, simply a statement of what the church with great unanimity believed. So this was not a creed that was given but simply a statement of what they had concluded from the study of the Word of God. And this, was, this made the foundation upon which the Seventh-day Adventist Church was built. God would again have his fortress in the world. Those who would stand upon a thus saith the Lord, who would require a thus saith the Lord for anything to be decided. It was not to be decided by what men may think or propose from the word of God, but what did the Lord say would be the determining factor. And God would have a people who would stand for the word of God, who would hold it as a lamp and a torch aloft to the world. And that people God raised up. And we know them in history as the Advent people, 
but they eventually became known as the Seventh-day Advent people. We know them today as Seventh-day Adventists. We talked and showed how that philosophy, when it entered into the church, how it corrupted its, the pure doctrines of the Bible, how men's interpretations of Scripture, how about what they thought about the Scripture became more prominent and more important than the Word of God itself. And this was what led to the formation of a creed. Because when the Word of God lost its power and authority, when a thus saith the Lord was no longer able to settle a dispute or to settle a difference among brethren, then it had to be that the state had to step in to decide what would be the official or Catholic definition of this doctrine. But God determined that he would have a people who the Bible would be their final authority and only authority in, on the earth. And that's what God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church to be. And for many years, that is what it was. But at the very time that God was establishing his people, Satan too was at work, just as he was in the days of the early church. At that very same time, a man by the name of Charles Darwin arose. And the idea of atheism began to spread in the world. And not only this, but shortly thereafter, at the time what we call the, the Renaissance and the flourishing of the Renaissance, in the 15th century on to the 19th century, the result was that there arose schools that adopted this philosophy of the world and incorporated into their schools. And they began to erect schools of what became termed, or we know today, as higher criticism. And it spread like fire throughout the Protestant churches in the world. And for a time, the Adventist church was a fortress against both atheism and higher criticism, which had flooded into the Protestant churches. But God's Adventist church ha upheld the Bible alone and remained a light in the world. But that did not remain so always. Because around the middle of the 1890s, higher criticism began to enter into the church. And men began to question the doctrines and the interpretations of the prophecies that had led us to become a people. And a movement was set abroad. And it reached such a peak, or especially around the turn of the 20th century, that a crisis arose in the church. And Sister White expresses it in these words. Now, this is from Special Testimonies. It was written specifically to ministers and physicians in Battle Creek, which was really the epicenter of this crisis within the church. And to give you a little bit of the history and background, the, the place was Battle Creek, Michigan. And Battle Creek was the center of Seventh-day Adventist education at the time. That was where young ministers and physicians went to be educated in both theology and in the medical missionary field. The sanitarium was housed there as well as the great school. And higher criticism and the, the teachings of the world had begun to creep into the Battle Creek College. And God gave to Sister White a warning to give to the church at this time. She cloaks it in these words, or I should say she expresses it in these words. Special testimonies, B, number two, she says, quote, What influence is it that would lead men at this stage of our history to work in an underhanded, powerful way to tear down the foundation of our faith? Now, she says that men were beginning to rise up in the church who were seeking to tear down the foundation that had been laid in the 1840s to 1860s, which, were estab which established us as a people. She says, the foundation that was laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon this foundation we have been building for the past 50 years. Do you wonder that when I see the beginning of a work that would remove some of the pillars of our faith, I have something to say? I must obey the command. 
meet it. Now you'll notice that that is in quotes. The command, meet it, was in quotes. That was not an opinion of Sister White. That was a direct command from God to her to meet this crisis. As I mentioned, the crisis centered around Battle Creek and the education that the ministers were receiving regarding the fundamental principles of our faith and in the sanitarium. And it was led on by one of the high figures in that sanitarium. His name was John Harvey Kellogg. And he had many under him who were leading this movement that brought the church to this crisis. And it resulted to what I term a return to Nicaea. She speaks of this. Now, this was written around 1904 to 1906. She speaks of something that was revealed to her, something that was going to happen shortly after her passing away off the scene. She says it in these words. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. A great what? Reformation. A reforming, a restructuring. And that this reformation would consist or be made up of in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganizing so there would be a new organization were this reformation to take place now she's speaking of it here because it had not come to pass yet she says were this to happen were this reformation to take place what would result the answer the principles of truth that god in his own wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence upon human power, which without God is worthless. Now, before I read the, the next sentence, I want to stop there for a moment. She says, God being removed. Which God? The God that had been established as the God of the Bible in the 1840s. The one that they had come to worship and believe in as the God of the Bible. That God would be put aside. And she doesn't say it, but it's implied that a new God would take its place. And she continues with the final sentence. Their foundation, that is theirs, not God's their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure, end quote. Now, before I read this last paragraph, she's not talking about the Protestant churches here. She's talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church and what would happen if they began to undermine the fundamental principles that had been established not by man, but by God. That in so doing, they would be putting God aside. And they would be building their church on a new foundation that was upon sand, not upon the rock. Christ would not be the foundation of this church, not the Christ of the Bible. And we're going to see the significance of the theological aspect of that tomorrow when we look at it. But notice, she concludes with this statement an encouragement, an admonition to the people of God. She says, who has authority to begin such a movement? Question mark. I might ask you, who has authority to begin such a movement? Anyone? No. no. General conference? No. General conference president? No. Pope? No. President? No. King? No. Emperor? 
Who? God. And God alone. We have our what? Bibles. We have our experience, which is history, attested to by the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. We have a truth that admits of no compromise. How much? No compromise. God, beloved, will have a people who will admit of no compromise. God is waiting for people who will stand firmly upon the Bible and the Bible alone and all inspiration and not move an inch, who will not compromise. God is waiting for such a people. She continues, Shall we not repudiate everything that is not in harmony with this truth? And that's what I want to put to us today. God has called us as watchmen upon the wall to warn the people, to lift up our voice and to repudiate error, to expose error. We are not to be dumb dogs. We are not to have respect of persons. We are to preach the truth and have respect only for God and his word. We must repudiate all that is not in harmony with the principles and truths that God himself has established. Now let me conclude. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. God speaks of those at this, at this very time when this crisis would come to a head. And I believe we are entering into the last stage of the final crisis when this history is to be repeated. Daniel says, And they that be wise... Remember we read about that wise before? They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. God speaks of a people who will be wise, who will stand as teachers, and that word wise could be also translated as teachers, and they would lead many to righteousness. They would shine as stars and I believe as stars in the crown of Christ forever and ever. That's what God wants. That's what God is waiting for. Now, I'm going to close with this statement. And I want to encourage us. This is written by a gentleman named Roswell Cottrell. It's in 1869. He says this, Men have gone to opposite extremes in the discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity. And those of you who are familiar with this doctrine and its history know just how true it is. It has extremes. He says, some have made Christ a mere man. Others have made him the God and Father of himself. I would simply advise all that love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to believe all that the Bible says of him and no more. Amen. Then you will have the truth and not occupy either of these extremes. And that's the admonition that I want to leave to us, for us today, that help us understand how this history is going to be repeated. The world is going to be brought to the worship of that first beast again, and it's going to be brought to that worship in the very same way that it was in the days of the first beast. And God will have a people who will sound the warning cry. Just as they did in those days, God will have a people. And my admonition to us, are you willing to take a stand upon the word of God? Are you willing to make the word of God your foundation? To stand upon a thus saith the Lord. To search its pages, to understand what the Bible says regarding God and to believe it. Regardless of what church or creed or pastor or priest may say. Are you willing to believe what the Bible says about God? In other words, what God himself reveals about himself. If that's your desire, then I want to invite you to kneel together with me in a word of prayer as we close. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, I pray that thy word that we have read this evening may glorify thee 
and that the words that thou hast spoken will not return unto thee void, but they will return unto thee accomplished. That thou wilt have a people who will hold that torch of truth aloft. Those will be as watchmen upon the wall to give the warning cry. Those, Father, who will be as the wise who will run to and fro, seeking, seeking and searching to know what thus saith the Lord. Not simply that they might know, but that they might obey, that they might be prepared to prophesy again, to give to the world the word of God for which the word, the world is languishing. Help us, O Lord, strengthen us, put within our hearts a desire to be that people, to be numbered among those who will faithfully give the word of God to the people, who will faithfully sound the warning and who will stand for thee though the heavens fall. Father, we bless thee and thank thee and I pray that thou will bless each and every one that has come here this evening, bless their ears and their hearts that they may be as good ground, that thy word may bring forth fruits of righteousness in them. For this is my prayer. In the blessed name of thy son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to close by saying, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen.